Good morning, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed the first morning of the LSX World Congress. And I'm delighted now to welcome you to the MedTech track where we're going to have a couple of days of discussion specifically uh, for, for the MedTech community. Uh, before I hand over to your panelists and your moderator, um, I'd just like to remind you all to please use the chat function, put lots of questions to the panel and they will do their best to address them throughout the discussion. So I'm delighted to introduce our keynote panel titled Brave New World, Europe's post-COVID-19 medical technology landscape. And I'll hand you over to your moderator today, Dan Kendall from Mission Based Media, who will introduce the session and the panelists in full. Dan, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Angela. It's good to be here. As she said, I'm Dan Kendall. I'm the founder of Mission Based Media. Uh, within Mission Based Media, we have the, the podcast platform, Digital Health Today, and I'm also the founder of Health Podcast Network. So we host conversations similar to this uh, through a variety of podcasts, and I invite you to come over and check out some of the work that we're doing there in an audio-only format. I'm really pleased to bring you this opening session this morning with two outstanding leaders from two global med device companies. With me today is Rob Tenhout. Rob is the Executive Vice President and President of EMEA for Medtronic. Rob started with Medtronic in 1991 as a marketing manager for Western Europe's neurological business, and he was based in Brussels at the time. In addition to executive leadership roles, Rob's been what you could call an intrapreneur within Medtronic, where he led the Medtronic's uh, gastro euro business in Europe, and he subsequently held global responsibility for that business. Overall, he has more than 25 years of experience in the med device uh, business, spanning sales, sales management, marketing, and general management. Uh, Rob is also the chairman of the board of MedTech Europe, the association which represents the medical technology industry in Europe. Also with me, also coming in from Switzerland, is Didier Del Tour. Didier is the president of EMEA for Zimmer Biomet. He's, he joined Zimmer Biomet in 2018 when he then uh, relocated to Switzerland. He's responsible for the manufacturing, sales, marketing, and distribution of products and services in the EMEA region, which incidentally, uh, EMEA for, uh, for Zimmer Biomet has over 6,500 team members. Didier also has more than 25 years in the medical device industry, spanning multiple geographies and medical technologies, including medical devices, diagnostic imaging, healthcare IT, and services. Before he joined Zimmer Biomet, he was with Boston Scientific as their global senior vice president and general manager for healthcare solutions and partnerships. And before that, he spent 14 years with GE Healthcare. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Before we kick off, I'd like to remind everyone what Angela said earlier, this is a live session here on Tuesday, uh, the 2nd of February at 10 a.m. Central European time. If you're tuning in live and you uh, do have a question, you can type those questions into the chat and we'll do our best to get through as many as possible. Uh, gentlemen, this opening session is about post-COVID-19 medical technology landscape in Europe. And now the cost of this pandemic has really exceeded what anyone really expected this to be. And, and the focus is really narrowed in terms of healthcare spend as elective procedures are postponed and care has really been uh, forced to be delivered as virtually as possible. So to start off this conversation, Didier, I'll start with you. Uh, as we begin to emerge from this crisis, what do you think we can expect to see in terms of EMEA healthcare budgets? Will we see a contraction uh, in healthcare spending as governments try to reset their budgets, their overall spending, or will we see continued investment in healthcare? So uh, thanks, Dan, first of all, for having us today together with uh, with you and, 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 and Rob. But uh, look, I'm, I'm a very optimistic person. And as you know, healthcare in Europe is a key critical pillar of our societies. And therefore, I do not see uh, any contraction uh, within the healthcare span in EMEA. Um, uh, I just see the opposite side. You know, I think uh, there have been a huge backlog of uh, surgeries waiting for being treated in the next uh, months and, and, and years to come. And I just see a, a huge investment coming our way to treat the patients, but at the same time to, to help, you know, healthcare providers and patients and payers, you know, delivering new care delivery models. So super optimistic about the future, which lies ahead of us. Rob, how about you? What do you think in terms of what we can expect to see from spending? Yeah, well, again, also thanks for having uh, for having uh, me in this uh, in this course, and it's great to be here with DJ, who's such a phenomenal leader in in Europe in medtech. So anyway, um, um, 
listen, I'm as optimistic as DJ. And I would even go a little further than, than looking at um, the backlog that's been created by COVID because that's clearly there and, and we will see the, the, the results of that. But I think what COVID has done is put a spotlight on healthcare in general and a spotlight on innovation. Uh, I mean, look, if we wouldn't have the capacity of the pharmaceutical industry to come up with the vaccination programs the way we see today, we wouldn't be seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And this is all innovation. But at the same time, it also put the spotlight on the quality and the process of healthcare delivery. And it shows that there is a world to improve out there. So I actually believe that we will see increased spending in healthcare in the coming years, that the percentage of the gross national product that will be spent in, in healthcare in the European countries will certainly not decrease, but it will at a minimum grow at the same rate as the, uh, the national product grows, but probably faster. And we will see an openness to adopt innovation and to look at new ways of delivering healthcare, which opens up a whole new uh, window of e-health, big data, AI solutions that will help to treat the right patient at the right moment in time with the right therapy. Uh, I think if any of us looked at value-based healthcare in the past, this last year has given, shed a complete different light on value-based healthcare. So uh, we, we need to implement new ways of working. We need to adopt new innovation. But when we, when we take a look at where we are right now, and we'll talk about post COVID, but during this pandemic, we're still in the throes of it. We're still being, uh, uh, you know, suffering through this across Europe and around the world. Uh, we'll get to some of the positives that we've learned out of it, but in terms of some of the lessons and some of the weakness that this, is, this pandemic has highlighted, um, we need to talk about those weaknesses. We need to be able to recognize them in order to know where we can do better. So uh, Rob, just to put it back to you, where do you think we, we have seen some of the weaknesses across the healthcare systems and, and how have we uh, either implemented fixes for that now or what do we need to do as businesses and leaders in the future? Right. That's a great question. Um, I think the learnings, um, there's a couple of learnings here. A, that innovation in healthcare is crucial. And if you go after healthcare companies like medical device or pharmaceutical only on a basis of price declines and trying to get the lowest possible price, it will eliminate innovation and ultimately it will it will be very painful for the healthcare system. So innovation is the lifeblood for the industry around healthcare, but also for healthcare delivery itself. I think that's one thing that's been this very clear. The other thing is that going for efficiency and process is a, is a very important aspect in healthcare. And capacity management is, has been shown to be a real challenge for the countries. So on one side, on, on a good day, everybody wants to have an efficient healthcare system that doesn't have a lot of redundancies, that doesn't have a lot of unused capacity. But then when a storm comes like this, how do you actually scale up and how do you manage that capacity appropriately? I think it's a massive learning for all of us. And that is not just on infrastructure, but it's also around staffing and personnel and, and how, do, how can you get access to nurses quickly, et cetera. So we're going to have to take a very close look at the, the flexibility of the healthcare delivery systems in all these countries. And how can you do that in an efficient manner when the sun shines, but when the storm comes, how can you scale up and make sure you can care for people? And I think, again, innovation and the way we deal with the use of people that we have limited resource, we, people, people, personnel is a limited uh, and scarce uh, good. How can we use that in the best possible way to, to continue delivery of healthcare in these kind of difficult moments? And for, for decades, we've spoken about some of the friction that we need to overcome when we do try to bring innovation into, uh, into practice, into the healthcare systems, deliver it at the patient's bedside or now more and more in the home. Uh, and there's, there's been a lot of resistance. And part of that is down to 
uh, the fact that budget's already set, there's already care models that have been delivered, and there's not been a huge necessity to change. But this is this pandemic has obviously changed that. We have to change, and and we've had to do things differently over the past 12 months and uh, for the foreseeable number of months in the future. So we need to talk about business model innovation and actually try to take uh, what has been a, maybe a traditional sort of exchange between value for products and services and, and try to move that into new areas of being business partners uh, with, with healthcare uh, systems and providers. So DJ, uh, how does that apply for an organization that, uh, you know, like yours that has uh, implants, there might be difference in, in coatings and materials, uh, but it's a really solid uh, body of, of evidence about the use of these products, and we need to become better business partners. So how does an organization go around to, to become a business partner when it's been traditionally sort of you buy a product that gets delivered uh, and gets implanted in the patient? Hey, thanks, Dan, for the question. And before I'm answering to this one, let, let me add to what uh, Rob just said, that uh, what we learned during COVID-19 is a completely different dynamics between public and private healthcare mm -hmm. with different incentives, different behaviors, different delivery models, and so on and so forth. And we all hope here on the, on the line that, that they will be in future, in general, a better job coordinating themselves with our help sometimes to deliver better healthcare to the patients uh, overall. But, uh, but to come back to your, to your question, I mean, what we learned is that, you know, um, um, our, our job is not just to, uh, to be at the table with the clinicians and to help them and the surgeons, but to, to really take into consideration the broad stakeholder, you know, perspectives. So uh, the payers um, and the providers on the big scheme, which means obviously the, um, the, the nurses, the caregivers, the, the, the physicians, the medical uh, doctors, the, the, the chief medical officers. The, uh, at, at the same time, the C-suite, who became increasingly important during the pandemic and simply wanted to talk to us also too and, and, and getting some advice and getting some help. So that's one piece. The role in our field of IT and biomedical engineering also became very important. So, so we are moving slowly for surely from a pure self-rep to clinician relationship to a broader stakeholder strategic account management and consultative selling you know, approach. And this is a transition for our forces. You know. Uh, selling metal and plastics to now metal and plastics plus digital health applications, plus eventually a surgery assisted technologies and not just selling you know, pure products, but solutions and, and enge entering into discussions for different kind of business models. A lot of learnings, things have been accelerated, obviously not at the same pace you know, in every country, but we have seen tremendous progress in this field and we've got to adapt, cope and, and to lead the change as well within our company. Rob, Medtronic's been talking about this sort of thing for many, many years, and uh, I'd say probably at least a decade as you've been talking about the changing business models and the ways that you've been trying to position your company to, to work in a, in a different way. How, how have you seen the progress over the, those 10 years, and have you seen things happening now that actually hold a better future for other companies that want to become better partners for the healthcare systems? Have there been things that have come about through this pandemic that have uh, forced a, a reset or a change in the way that people are working with organizations like yours? Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, yeah, we've been talking about this change for a long time. And, you know, healthcare doesn't change fast. So we're gonna have to talk about it for another 10 years, I'm afraid, before we are all where we, where we want to be. Um, to DJ's point, this whole broader stakeholder capitalism, if you will, or stakeholder connection that we need to build is really, really relevant. Um, you know, 10 years ago, who would have thought that a company like Medtronic would run, uh, you know, 280 cat labs and operating rooms in public hospitals in Europe? Nobody would have thought that. Today, we are. And we are, we're, we're managing those departments. We're helping the hospitals to, to become more uh, effective and efficient with their resources so that those resources that are now being used in operating rooms in an inefficient way can actually be redeployed to an ICU when it's necessary or so the, the flexibility of people is really important I already talked about it so when COVID started to impact our healthcare systems in Europe we had a lot of our customers reaching out to Medtronic to say can you help us with this COVID situation? Can you help us organize our hospital? Can you help us making sure that COVID patients are not becoming in contact with, you know, elective cases? Um, 
and we went all the way to setting up test streets uh, in the parking lot of, uh, of, of big hospitals. So we really tried to be of service in a broad way to the healthcare system. And to me, that is a signal that people are crying for help in the healthcare world. And there is a role to be played by us, large um, uh, healthcare medtech players to support those systems and those, those providers with the right solutions. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an absolute strong believer that ultimately we will move away from sending a box with a pacemaker and an invoice a week later to becoming much more involved in the delivery of that pacemaker and also the post-surgical uh, follow-up of that pacemaker. And, and maybe the whole business model will change from this one invoice to a monthly invoice that's going to be a long-term relationship with uh, the hospital or ultimately the patient. So uh, there's going to be a lot of change happening in healthcare in the coming years. Data, AI, new technologies, uh, e-health, all this stuff will start to become real. And uh, it's going to change the business models of the, of the big corporates in this space, absolutely. The good news is if we do this as corporates, the startup world can continue to do their innovation focused on those small uh, uh, steps forward and they can become integrated into the overall offering that, uh, that companies will bring. I think the audience is picking up on the same direction where I wanted to take this conversation next. I have a question from Christoph uh, Philibert. Again, remember to type your, your questions into the chat uh, and we'll get to as many as we can. But the next thing I want to ask you about is actually the same thing Christoph asked about, which is around the faster, will this drive a faster transition to home care and ambulatory care? Uh, we talked before in our earlier conversation around the potential use of ambulatory surgical centers. Uh, so how do you see those sorts of, of models being delivered across Europe and how will that change uh, the, the care models, but also the, the uh, models for businesses like yours? Sorry, Didier, you to go you ahead, Dan? Yeah, yes, yeah, no, yeah. It, 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 it's a great question. And as Rob said, we, we used to focus only at uh, at the one part of the episode of care, what's happening within the OR or what's happening within the intensive care. And, and what, has been, what has been happening for the last 18 months is that caregivers are asking us to help them with what's happening before the episode of care, what's happening after, and can we help them with um, efficiency programs, with digital health solutions. And, and for example, we have had for more than 20 years a rapid recovery program which never really took off, you know, only a few of people in the EMEA were adopting it very successfully, but it never really took off because the incentives were not there to reduce length of stay. Now with what's happening within COVID, you know, obviously having pre-op assessment, digitize, reducing the number of visits from the hospital during COVID-19, doing a great job in the operating room and helping the patient to be on her or her feet as fast as possible Staying in, in, in touch with him or her digitally and hanging sure that you know the rehabilitation is done digitally and well is increasingly becoming important. So, so I'm sure we will see the emergence of those technologies and solutions in this field. And then, and we have been lucky to partner with Apple Computer in this field, and have been deploying some of those solutions in EMEA, and it has produced great results so far. So, uh, so I think once again, something which was a nice to have in the in the past is. is probably going to become a must have in the future because what we have seen is defining great clinical and economical outcome is, is, is broader than just what's happening within the OR and, and during the, the surgery side. Yeah, if I maybe can add to that, if you, if you look in the United States and, and uh, the business we're doing while COVID is going on in, in the US, you can see that the ASCs in the US continue to perform really well. And because they don't, they're not focused on the, the, the COVID patients, they just continue to do the elective care. Now, if, why do we have that surge of, of ASCs in the US and, uh, and how did that come about? It came about because of the innovation that medical technology companies bring forward. The fact that we now can do minimally invasive technologies, uh, deploy those technologies in a way that people can be short stay patients in many indications where in the past people would be, you know, one, two weeks in the hospital. Today, they're leaving the hospital the same day. 
That's because of new approaches of, of these kind of uh, surgical interventions that are driven by innovation that comes out of medtech. If you add to that uh, the whole you know, tsunami of new minimally invasive technologies that will be coming to us in the next coming years that our engineers are working on today, plus the robotics that are starting to become serious. You know, you have a few companies today and 5% and of the surgeries are maybe done with a robot. The, the next coming years, that will go all the way up to ultimately um, 60, 70% of the surgeries being done through a robot. So that's going to change the landscape of healthcare delivery dramatically, and it will drive completely different uh, delivery outfits that are going to be focused on certain surgical interventions and become absolute specialists on it, using all the new uh, innovations that are available. What needs to happen is that the reimbursement systems are going to follow that. So the, the technology is there, the way we can deliver, we know how to do it. We now need to make sure that the, the reimbursement follows that path. So uh, Sharath Chandra has asked a question that uh, is similar to something that I th think about as a former sales rep and marketing manager myself for a med device company, uh, in terms of the, the changes that you've had to, ha to put into place as organizations, your customers are not doing the sort of procedures that they would normally do. You're not able to go see them. You have sales teams and marketing teams and events and product launches that have just been absolutely uh, put to a, a standstill, I imagine. Uh, in large part, because you, you've just had to to adjust to the new environment. So as we look ahead, you've got all these sales teams, uh, hopefully been able to retain a lot of that staff. You've got different models that you'll need to, to, to uh, train them on and that they'll need to represent to your customers. So what sort of change does that mean to the traditional sales rep role? Uh, and, and what emphasis does that put, or how does that change the emphasis on relationships and where those relationships exist within organizations like yours? Uh, Didier, should we start with you? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great, um, great uh, question from Chandra. And, and I tell you, you know, we used to, to be basing our model on a pure sales rep to surgeon relationship model, face-to-face, -face, supporting the OR, et cetera. And, and COVID-19 taught us that we can still do a great job remotely when needed. And, and, but what it forced us to do is to know even better our customers, so segment our customers, you know. Those customers we need, you know, on OR support, those customers we can be supported remotely from within the hospitals um, because they do not allow us to enter into the OR. And those who actually would welcome, you know, uh, to be supported from outside of the hospital. So, we have been piloting some solutions quite successfully in EMEA in some countries, in some markets where customers were open about it. And I think we are preparing ourselves to, to deliver those different care delivery models or care support delivery models, depending on the customer segmentation, what they are looking for, and also to see how we can be better organized um, uh, past COVID-19 with those different service delivery offerings. Yep, couldn't agree with uh, DJ Moore. I, um, you know, you're lucky because you have two of the companies uh, on this panel that have been really busy with, with, you know, focusing on business model innovation and 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 new ways of delivery, um, and and so in a way, what what um, COVID has done for us is it it ac accelerates a lot of the stuff that we were already doing. Um, and we were surprised by our own ability, actually, to interact with hospitals in a different way. So our salespeople have been, you know, using uh, Zoom and FaceTime and whatever to connect with physicians. We've made some investments as a company in our ability to do remote case support, where we have, you know, a camera set in the hospital and people sitting in an office and following the, the surgery on all the elements and, and being able to, to provide uh, input if needed. Um, and that's been going really well, actually remarkably well. So, so clearly this, this kind of crisis um, give you an ability to test out other stuff that normally people would have a bigger threshold to, to move into. And now because of the circumstances you do and you can see that there is different ways of doing uh, uh, things that could actually be better than what we were doing in the past. So yes, it will, it will accelerate some of that change. Uh, luckily, we were already on that journey of customer segmentation and making under, and, and really understanding the needs of the different customers and 
profiling our sales organizations alongside of that. Um, and that's just going to continue. Um, and some of it's going to go back to normal. I think we're not going to continue to FaceTime with all our customers. Uh, I can promise you that. But 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 we we will continue to use these kind of technologies alongside. Do you think, and if, I mean, you, if you don't mind, I'm sorry. Yeah, and if you don't mind, then um, you know what I used to say to the team. So we used to brainstorm together with my leadership team. Is is COVID nineteen has been the the fastest and the cheapest leadership development program. That's been the fastest and cheapest leadership development program. We all believed that the way for us EMEA business leaders would be to leave home on Monday morning and be back on Thursday evening and to be with the customers and the teams three, four, five days a week. And, and it has proven that we can still lead large remote organizations remotely and quite successfully. It does not mean that we don't need or we don't want to visit the teams, but there will be a better balance moving forward for leaders in this medtech industry and also for the sales reps and the marketing folks and, and then spend that time where really they can contribute and add value and really invest in places where we can really drive meaningful and affordable innovation. And I think that's what's going to change moving forward and for better for a better medtech industry and support to our customers. Yeah, I think we've seen a, a lot of different uh, areas of innovation, and I think it has driven some necessity for changing. I mean, as you said, people would normally just get on a plane and travel. We would normally be getting together in London for this meeting instead of here on Zoom with our audience, uh, but we, we've been forced to change and adapt. So do you think that this is also going to unleash a new level of creativity? Has it given organizations, large organizations and small early stage businesses uh, an opportunity to really uh, focus on some of their key things? And what sorts of things do you think that we'll see uh, as these innovations are brought to market and how will that help uh, move us towards a, a sort of a transition to value-based care here in Europe. So lots of different things wrapped up in that question. Rob, I'll start with you. Um, so, yeah. so is there gonna be greater creativity brought to the market? Will that support uh, value-based uh, delivery of care? Yeah, well, yeah, this, this, is, this question holds like uh, 20 other questions. So let me, let me try. First of all, just, just imagine that we're gonna do travel again in the future, but now we're gonna combine travel with Zoom ability. So now I'm, I'm, I'm able to go to a country, be with the country, take an hour and a half and do a Zoom call and do what I'm doing now the whole day from home. Just the level of effectiveness and, and efficiency that I can bring in my life is gonna change in the, in the future. So the combination of the two is gonna be very powerful. Uh, and, and, you know, anyway, so that's, that was just a thought. Um, on on value-based healthcare, listen, um, I think the spotlight on healthcare, as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, the spotlight on healthcare has shown and brought to the surface some of the delivery issues that the healthcare system has. And, and Michael Porter already wrote in his book on healthcare that there is 30 to 40% waste in the system. And I think this, this crisis shows that there is a problem in the way that healthcare delivery is being organized. And, and that is the big opportunity for all of us. So um, I, what you will see is the European Union is already putting a lot of money behind all this research that they would like to have e-health and other technologies enter the space of healthcare delivery. So, so that journey is going to continue. What you're going to see is a much bigger appetite, and we already see it today, with payers and, and uh, providers to come up with different solutions on how to pay for care and, and how to pay for the services that can be provided through companies like ours. Um, so I'm absolutely very optimistic about the flexibility that we will find in the markets for people to try other things than what they've been doing in the past. And that fills me with a lot of optimism because I know for a fact that, I mean, I'm in my role as the chairman of uh, MedTech Europe, I have been so pleased to see over the last year um, very different companies joining MedTech Europe. We have Apple as our a member. We have Google as a member uh, because they all see the opportunity in the healthcare space and the added value that these companies can bring. So if you look at the new tech, so the new big 
tech companies. You can look at the medtech and putting tech into the medtech environment. You can look at biotech, which is just an incredible opportunity for healthcare and the pharmaceutical industry that in combination with innovation in the healthcare delivery, I, I think we're gonna, we're gonna have an incredible future in healthcare. And I would recommend every kid at every university to go to work in this healthcare space. That's the place to be. Didier, what, thank you, Rob. Didier, what do you have to add to that? Look, uh, I've been trying to convince my two daughters, you know, for nearly two decades to move into healthcare. I've not been successful so far, so maybe Rob can help me, you know, uh, convincing them. But, uh, but jokes aside, uh, I, I think there will be three areas of innovation. Number one, and we spoke about it, we touched upon that at the beginning, it's about anything which can contribute to the continuum of care. It's not just about what's happening before or during or after a surgery or whatever, you know, but, but along the care pathway. I think a lot of innovation is going to come there. And it's not going to be only about hardware and products anymore, but products together with software, together with consulting services along the care pathway. And, and any company who has something to add and contribute in this field is going to have a, a, a great right. The, the second piece is anything we can do to expand the reach of care. Because here we are sitting here in, in Western Europe, and let's not forget that both with Rob, we are covering large territories in emerging markets. And we have a duty, we have a responsibility to help some of those markets with solutions, which either were not available, affordable for those, but we could become available in the future for them. So expanding the reach of care to those territories is going to create a massive opportunities for companies like ours and others. And last but not least, this notion of personalized healthcare, tailor-made approaches is also going moving forward to be increasingly important for the care delivery systems and as well as companies like us. Excellent. So we've talked about innovation and uh, I think as we spoke about in our pre in our preparation call, uh, there's this is a great opportunity for innovators, both intrapreneurs within organizations like yours, as well as earlier stage businesses. We're seeing a growth in investment. Uh, we're seeing some tremendous IPOs in the innovation space that's really transforming the way that people are thinking about and procuring and delivering care. Um, so when we take a look at the European space, what do we have that we can be really excited about? Uh, we, we know we've, we've looked at Boston, we've looked at, at Silicon Valley, we've looked at uh, lots of innovation that's happening in some of the riskier, more uh, profit-driven models in the US. Uh, we've got a great innovation culture here. Didier, you and I were speaking even this morning uh, about some of the innovation that happens in places like Switzerland and France and Finland and, and uh, the Netherlands. So what do we have to really be excited about? Rob, I'll, I'll go to you first, because uh, you, you mentioned that uh, Medtronic has actually made some uh, purchases here. Uh, they've acquired uh, companies here in Europe recently, right? Yep, yeah, we did. We, we've always done. Listen, if you look, uh, I, I say this often, but if you look at the product portfolio of Medtronic, um, and I might be a little biased because I'm a European, but uh, we, we've done the scoring uh, on where did these inventions originally came from. And around 65% of our product portfolio are European inventions. Okay, so um, there's no doubt in my mind, and you see it still, that the creativity, the creativity and the way that the academics and, and research works in Europe is an incredible stimulus of, of, uh, of innovation that's continually going on. The challenge we always have in Europe is to bring the money together with the ideas. And there's a lot of money in the US, there's lesser uh, of that entrepreneurship and, and, and uh, money available in, in Europe, but there's a lot, a lot of creativity in Europe and a lot of ideas. And uh, you know, if you look at uh, some of the acquisitions we've done over the last uh, years, there's quite a number of European players in that because there is that, that, that real um, understanding of uh, the need for healthcare change and healthcare delivery change. You find that a lot in, in the European context. So I'm very enthusiastic about the creativity in Europe. We just have to make sure we, we bring um, the necessary funds together with those ideas so we can even drive that more, uh, more aggressively. And ultimately, all these products will enter the whole world. It's, it, and, and I think that's the uh, recommendation I have for every startup is, you know, don't look at Europe only, don't look at the US as the holy grail. Uh, you're gonna have to look at 
the US, Europe, China, and the opportunity in the emerging markets. And that, that, that's how you immediately have to set up your company. Thank you, Rob. Didier, what would you like to add to that? I look, I'm in violent agreement with Rob. <laughs> I'm in violent. I've had the pleasure to, uh, to lead research and development teams in Finland, in Germany, in, in China, India, and in the US, and, and Brazil. And, and I tell you, uh, at least in the, in the field that I've been, uh, I've been part for the last couple of decades, uh, Europe has played a major role. And, and even in the, the one I'm, 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 I'm responsible for these days, orthopedics, many, many, many innovations came from uh, from Europe. So uh, so Europe will still play a major role when it comes to innovation. And as Rob said, you know, uh, it's not that we are not risk takers, but it, 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 it's the funding uh, mechanism which needs to be improved. And, uh, and and that's where, you know, we need to um, we need to do a better job overall in the EMEA. But uh, you and me discussed this morning, you know, when when sitting in in Finland, you know, we have created a healthcare startup companies, incubators, giving them 1,000 square meters, hosting 25 startup companies. And they clearly helped us, you know, to, to change the culture of innovation within the large company and helped us to innovate. And they became successful companies afterwards. So uh, still a major place for Europe in the global innovation, you know, landscape, definitely. Do you think that some of the structures uh, from a technology development and from uh, the, the overall healthcare system, do you think that it's it's actually enabled more innovation to take place outside of larger organizations? I, th I think in some ways, larger organizations were sort of like the space programs 30, 40 years ago. You had to have a government's resources to be able to fund a space program. And I think in a lot of ways in healthcare, you had to have resources of a major med tech company or pharma company in order to be able to really drive the change uh, and develop the sort of solutions that could actually get things to, to, to market. But are we seeing a breakdown and in, in, uh, an improvement perhaps in terms of the access to different systems that's going to allow organizations like yours, instead of feeling like you have to develop and fund and create everything yourself to see some of these things succeed externally and bring them in as partners or acquisitions or uh, lead investors in some of these things. Where does that sort of stack up? Rob, I see you nodding in agreement there. Yeah, no, no, I just, I'm in total agreement with you. And there was another question on uh, uh, that I saw coming in on uh, along those lines of you know niche players and, and 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 large companies. So you know obviously the large companies will continue to do innovation. And if you look at how innovation is being how innovation money is being spent, when you have a strong market position, a lot of your spending is to maintain your main product lines. So to make sure you continue continuously improve. Your, your product lines that you have in the market and stay competitive and, and offer added value to patients and physicians. And you do a little bit of kind of brand new development uh, R&D in, in new spaces. But as a large company, you cannot do it all. So we really need the world of startups that, that are the niche players that focus on something to bring it to a certain level. And as a large corporate, we become more of an integrator of care and, and, and take those technologies and put them along the care pathway and build the business models around it. Uh, so we need that whole ecosystem to work. Uh, it's, the, it's the big corporates that will come in and be the total solution providers to a large extent where they, they will integrate a lot of the, the different things that are going on. Then there is innovation going on that, that will always be there. Uh, to maintain our products, then there is a little bit of innovation going on for brand new products and the rest will get acquired. And that's totally, that's totally appropriate. So that ecosystem, uh, we're always going to, we're, we're, we're going to always see and, and we're going to have to bet on that. Didier, I want to come to you in a second, but just Rob, to follow up on that first, uh, you're the chairman of MedTech Europe. And you mentioned that you've got Apple and Google as members of that. That's great in terms of seeing outside uh, non-traditional players coming into an organization like that. But are there other opportunities for some of the early stage players to be able to participate in an organization like that and, and find some way to be successful and work with organizations on a larger scale? First of all, I, I, I think there is a place in healthcare for everybody because the problems in healthcare to be solved, or let me put it differently, the opportunities that we can go after in healthcare to, to, uh, to improve is so wide that I don't see any 
I don't have any fear or nervousness around different players starting to come in. So if, if Apple and Google think they can add value, which I truly think they can, they are very welcome into this space because uh, there, there's big, big issues we need to tackle. But a small startup company who's really focused on one element of one subspecialism to improve that aspect is also extremely valuable in the whole chain of things. So um, I think people need to look what added value they can bring in that whole delivery environment of healthcare, all the way from early diagnosis or even prevention to uh, post, post-surgical or chronic disease management, home management, that whole journey, there's so much to be done between providers, corporate, startup companies, uh, uh, and other industries that, that I think uh, it, it's going to be a very exciting place where you can see a lot of things coming together. Thank you, Rob. Didier, how about you in terms of the innovation ecosystem and what we have here? What are some of the opportunities? You mentioned that you've had startups come into your office building and give them space to work and things. So what are some of the opportunities for earlier businesses here in Europe? Look, my view is the following, Dan. As big as you can be as an organization, it's almost nearly impossible to have it all built organically and internally. Okay. Some companies are better than hardware. Some companies are better than software. Some companies are better in embedded software, not in the cloud. Some companies are better in developing services or solution or whatsoever. I truly believe that in the 21st century, leadership is about not to trying to do it all organically or internally, but to partner with a broader ecosystem. And, and that's clearly what I've been doing in the former companies. But today at Zima Biomat, we are doing and partnering with large, small, and medium enterprises, you know, to help us deliver, develop, and deliver some of those solutions that we spoke about, you know, covering the entire care pathway episodes, you know, helping before, during, and after surgeries, and, and addressing some of the on the needs, not only from the providers, but also the patients and the payers. So, so I think innovation in this field is going to be to be open, not to have the not invented here syndrome that some companies might have, you know, in the past, and then be open to others. And, and in this field, and that's why, you know, together with MedTech Europe, we are not just representing the large enterprises, but as well as the small and the medium enterprises in EMEA who have a future and with whom we are partnering, you know, um, um, and daily. Thank you. Rob, do you want to add something to that? No, no, but I just saw a question coming by on colonialism, and I, uh, I'm, very, uh, I'm very sensitive to that point, so I really want to quickly comment on that, if you allow me, Dan. Um, Please, yes, absolutely. Yeah, because that was, that was the industry of the past. The industry of the past was we developed products in the United States or, or Europe, and then we would just throw them over the fence into the emerging markets and those who could afford it, they could buy them and the ones who didn't, you know, too bad. And the revenues that would come out of these emerging markets were a little bit like the cherry on the cake of, uh, at the end of every quarter. Those days have dramatically, dramatically changed. And the opportunity and our responsibility in the emerging markets is massive and, and we're taking that extremely serious. Uh, so as Medtronic, we've been localizing a lot of our manufacturing into these kind of uh, um, uh, emerging environments, whether it's China or India or the Middle East and Africa. Uh, we're developing products specifically for that, for those countries. We are, I'm actually a strong believer that in those countries, they can leapfrog themselves into new healthcare delivery models, which Europe and the US, with all the legacy infrastructure, it's so hard to get there. But actually in those countries, we can, we can show that there's new ways of healthcare delivery that can be much more effective and efficient than, than what the Western world is doing today. So we're extremely serious about our emerging markets opportunities. And, and it's certainly not an afterthought. It's actually front and center for our growth strategy. Right. Did you have anything you want to add to that about the question around? Uh, oh, no? to, to Totally agree with uh, Rob, huge opportunities for us. And actually many innovations are coming from some of those countries. And when I look at what we've got within our Zima Biomed Institute and medical faculty, et cetera, a lot of great names from emerging markets for, for sure. 
Okay, we need to wrap up. We're almost out of time here. So just one last question for you both, if you could just quickly give me a response on this. I get a sense that we're all optimists here and that we're all very optimistic about the future. As we get through this, we know we will get through this pandemic and we'll come out the other side. When we look back on 2020, 2021, and we're experiencing the success in the new environment that we're dealing with two, three, five years from now, what do you think will be the, the key learning or lesson that you will look back at this period and say, that's what we, uh, th that, that drove the change that we're able to benefit from now in the years ahead. So Rob, can I start with you? What, what are you most optimistic about uh, or in terms of what, what's the problem that you think we will yeah. address uh, as we come out of this? Yeah, you know, the word optimistic, I need to be careful with because in that correlation, but I, let me, okay. let me say in a very short few words, um, We've had a lot of discussion about the value of, about value-based healthcare. How valuable is it? What is the return to society if we do all these procedures, whether it is hips and knees or pacemakers or spine surgery or all this stuff? And there was a there's always been a lot of debate around over treatment and unnecessary interventions, etc. In this time, the 12 months behind us, if you look at the excess mortality that took place on top of the COVID deaths that we had to suffer as a society. The, the excess mortality is completely due to the not doing the elective interventions that we were always doing. If anything shows the value of healthcare delivery and elective care, it's, it's those numbers. And, you know, yes, we have to deal with a lot of COVID deaths and it's awful, but look at the excess mortality in every country and what happens the moment you start to take away elective care from, from patients. So if, if anything is gonna be the driving force for me, if I communicate with policymakers, et cetera, it's that number, it's that excess mortality number. The fact that in the first wave of COVID, we saw a drop of 80% of people showing up with a stroke in a hospital. That is the problem. And I think that that has shown incredible, the incredible value that we as an industry and as a healthcare system bring every day. Thank you, Robert. And did you just something quickly in terms of the lessons that we're going to learn from this as we go through the other side? So, so look, um, I'm carefully optimistic. And I would say what, what pandemic has been uh, teaching us is, is, is resilience. It's a trust for each other, the respect and the care for each other. And there is one, only one concern I would have these days, not to finish on a negative note, but the focus from healthcare societies and governments has been on the healthy population. And we got to think also about the young population. We got to think about the youngsters who are going to be the people making a better world tomorrow. And, and, and we have a responsibility within our organizations, not only to protect the elderly population, but also take care of the young, the young generation. And I would say the big challenge for all of us, and we touched upon that the other day, is a human resource management. When we speak to the caregivers, they said during the first wave pandemics, it was a product supply issue, a lack of PPE, a lack of gloves, a lack of masks, a lack of respirators, et cetera. Second wave was really how do we increase capacity? We saw many healthcare systems be able to increase capacity for 10 or 15% in many countries in EMEA. Now, when we speak to the to caregivers, it, it's a human resource management. People are tired about working remotely. People are tired to be on the pandemics. And overall, this is an industry challenge for us is how we will keep our work workforces engaged and collaborating furthermore together with the caregivers overall. But, but very optimistic about, a f about the future, but still a lot to do to make sure our teams remain engaged and we keep doing a great job together with the customers. Brilliant. Well, we'll leave it there. I want to remind all the attendees that if you joined late or if you're uh, uh, coming in and you want to replace some of the, the answers and questions here, that this is available on the platform to be played back uh, at your convenience. Um, I want to thank you, Didier. I want to thank you, Rob, for uh, being with us on this panel, as well as for all the work that all of your teams, uh, both within Europe and around the world, are doing. It's hard work supporting the care teams and the healthcare systems. And uh, we, we recognize the healthcare workers that are out there in the front, but we also recognize the people who are working within organizations like yours that are making the products and the solutions that's going to make everything better. So thank you and thank you for all your organization's work. Uh, I'm Dan Kendall. I hand back to you, Angela. 
Thank you, Dan, for that wonderful wrap up and, and very, very positive um, thoughts going forward. Um, look, that was a wonderful discussion. Thank you so much for, for your time. And thank you to all of our audience for being so proactive with posting questions and comments. I'd like to remind you if we didn't get to your questions, just use the messaging tool on the swap card, swap card platform to uh, follow up with our panelists directly and have your questions answered. Now, next, um, next up on the MedTech track, uh, we'll have a panel at 12 o'clock British time looking at patient-centric approaches in MedTech. But in the meantime, thank you again, Dan, Didier and Rob, and goodbye, everyone. Thank you.